Well, there were a group of scientists, each in their own fields, were tremendously successful and world-renowned. And one day, they all got together and decided they would focus their efforts on solving the greatest mystery of all, life and where it came from. So they worked and they toiled and they labored for 10 years experimenting and hypothesizing until one day they had a phenomenal breakthrough. And they used their findings to construct this machine and they would shovel dirt from the earth into this machine and it would whip the dirt around with all the minerals and molecules and proteins and spit out a fully formed, living, breathing human being on the other side. It was a tremendous accomplishment, and so they gathered together news outlets and reporters from around the world in order to celebrate their great deeds, and the scientist and head of the committee stepped forward to the microphone and began his address by saying, ladies and gentlemen, we no longer need God. Well, when God learned that he had recently become unnecessary, it was news to him, so he decided that he would put these men to the test. And he descended to the earth, and he gathered these men, and he said, fellas, I hear I'm not needed anymore. Would you care to explain? They said, gladly. We have made a machine that enables us to make a man just as good as any you could create. So God said, that's very interesting. I propose a contest. You make a man your way, and I'll make a man my way, and then we'll compare, and and we'll see who did it better. Well, the scientists agreed enthusiastically and began shoveling dirt from the earth into their machine, and that's when God interrupted and said, "Uh, whoa, 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 fellas, Uh, what what are you doing there? And they explained, well, we're taking dirt from the earth, putting our machine to make a man, and God said, I understand that. It's just, you know, now that we're competing against one another, it doesn't really seem right that that you would use my dirt. I'm afraid you're going to have to go create your own before we can go any further. And one by one, the scientists slowly began to realize that maybe God wasn't quite as unnecessary as they had thought. I like that little anecdote. You may have heard it before. It's kind of old. I think my preacher told me that when I was like 10 or something. And whether you've heard it or not, it illustrates a point fairly well, I think, that regardless of how successful we might become or how advanced we might become, we never really outgrow our need for God. He is always responsible in some way for the success that we experience in life. And I see that principle unfold in my own life as I was thinking over it and reflecting this week. You know, I'm, I'm a relatively healthy person. I get sick once in a while, but most of the time I'm, I'm at like 90%, which is the best you can hope for, I think. I don't go to the doctor very often, and some of you may cringe at that, but others of you know why I think that's a good thing. And other than like a, a broken nose and some wisdom teeth, I've never undergone surgery. And we could chalk that up to healthy living or good genetics or just being very fortunate. But at the end of the day, when I consider all the different diseases that swirl around in our world and all the conditions that just randomly befall our bodies sometimes, I can't help but feel that that God has blessed my life in that way with good health. And the same is true of your life, too. You know, when you think back over the good that fills your life, whether it be your, your family and your kids, or maybe it's a career success, or maybe you walked away from a car accident, or you overcame some condition against all odds. When you think about the good that fills our lives, we could chalk it up to coincidence or luck or chance, but this morning I think we're better served if we just call a spade a spade and say, God has blessed your life. We started a series last week called Hashtag Blessed. It's all about the blessed life and what God has to do with it. And this morning, specifically, we're talking about recognizing God's blessing in our lives. There are a lot of things that can distract us and can cause us to mistake God's blessing, and our passage this morning actually alerts us to a few of those. If you've got your Bibles with you, why don't you open them up to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, is where we're going to be today. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. You can follow along on the screen behind, or even better, you can pull open the YouVersion Bible app on your mobile device and follow along there. In any event, we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 8 this morning. Now, like I said, there are several reasons why we might overlook or mistake God's blessings in our lives. Sometimes we miss God's blessing due to bad circumstances or negative circumstances. You know, there be maybe some of us in here this morning, and you're just feeling really low today. Like maybe things have just gone wrong, or maybe you're discouraged or disillusioned. And maybe you just can't possibly imagine how God might be blessing your life at this point in time because things just look bleak. And if that is you or that has ever been you, 
know that you are by no means alone in feeling that way. In fact, God's Old Testament people went through a season exactly like that at a point in time in their history. That's what our passage is recapping. They spent 400 years as slaves in Egypt. And then God released them, which was a good thing, but then they immediately spent the next 40 years just kind of wandering around aimlessly through the wilderness. And it wasn't an easy place to live. You know, food was in short supply. Water was scarce. Boredom, that was in abundance. Every once in a while, they would have to overcome a people or a group that was more powerful than them or better organized than them, but largely their days were consisted, just consisted of aimless wandering through the wilderness. It was a very boring, dull time. In fact, there were some people that even asked, why has God brought us out here to die? They just couldn't see how God might possibly be blessing them during that season of life. And that's kind of what our passage is talking about. Moses is speaking to these people right before they're about to enter into a new season of life, a blessed season where things would be great. But before they do, he recalls that frustrating time. But he speaks about it in a surprisingly positive way. Listen to how he talks about it in chapter 8, verse 1. He says, Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known about, to teach you that man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Listen to this part in particular. Your clothes didn't wear out. And your feet didn't swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. So Moses doesn't really shy away from the difficulties of this season. You know, he kind of identifies there that this was a time of hunger and that this was a time of humbling. Those humbling seasons of life are rarely positive experiences. You probably can recognize that in your own life. In my life, I can very confidently say the humbling times are not fun. There was a, one time in particular that comes to mind. I was about midway through college, and a church in Arkansas had contacted me about heading up their junior high department. Now, that was kind of a cool thing. They, they sought me out, which is usually a good sign. The interview process went well. We had dinner with the elders, and one of them even said, we think you're the guy. I was feeling pretty confident, and why shouldn't I? I mean, I I worked harder than most people in my program. I was more talented than the majority of people in my program. It really was only a matter of time before an opportunity like this fell in my lap, right? As you may have picked up, I may have been a little more than confident in my abilities and in my situation there. There was some arrogance to be dealt with, and God dealt with it. You see, I hadn't made any living arrangements for that summer in Joplin where we were going to school because I thought I was going to be living in Arkansas. And I had turned down two other internships for that summer because I thought I was going to be in Arkansas. And then I got a phone call that told me I would not be in Arkansas. Turns out I was not the guy they were looking for. And I felt like the rug had just been pulled out from under me because all of a sudden I had no summer plans, no job prospects or opportunities, and no place to live. It was a humbling experience. I ended up moving back home and and working as a temp in a factory in my hometown for the summer. And it was a hard job. It was a good job, but it was hard and a lot different from what I thought I was going to be doing. Those humbling seasons are rarely fun. And that's the kind of situation that Israel found itself in. And you would expect Moses to really just be blunt about it. You guys remember that humbling time and how much it stunk? Remember how hungry you were? Woo! That was the worst. It was horrible. But that's not what he says. Instead, he talks about how God blessed them despite their difficult circumstances. Specifically in verse 4, that passage, or that verse I drew your attention to, he mentions how for 40 years their clothes didn't wear out. That's not normal or natural. I can't make a pair of jeans go four years before I bust a hole in them, let alone 40. God blessed them in that way. And he says, for 40 years, despite all your wandering around in the wilderness, your feet didn't swell. 
Now, this may be TMI, but after one day of walking around all day, my feet get that puffy, sweaty funk going on in my shoes, and it feels good to put them up at the end of the day because they're sore. But for 40 years, they didn't experience that. Now, you might be saying that seems like a small good in their life compared to all this frustration and trial, but sometimes when you find yourself in difficult circumstances, it's those small things that serve as the greatest blessing. When I was 17, uh, my parents split up. Um, you know, I was 17, so I was still just trying to figure out normal stuff, like what am I going to do with my life, and who am I, and what do girls really want in a guy? You know, important, life-shaping things like that. But then I also had all this other stuff on top of it, like what, what is my family going to look like going forward, and what is life going to be like, and what are holidays going to be like? And there was a lot I was trying to figure out. It was kind of a, a gray, bleak time of my adolescence. And it was about this time that my uncle started to call me up on the phone and say, hey, do you want to take a ride? And he would come by on a Thursday night, Friday night, and we'd jump in his truck and drive around the back roads in Marion County for a couple hours. And, and sometimes we talked about important stuff, but most of the time we just talked about stupid stuff and laughed. And it wasn't a big, grand gesture. It wasn't anything that was super costly or expensive or profound. It's something simple and small. But that simple, small thing became a source of light in my life in a time that was kind of bleak and gray and hard. And I looked forward to those phone calls. You see, we all have difficulties and trials and seasons of, of humbling in our lives. And in, in those times, it can be difficult to understand, that, you know, how could God possibly be blessing me through all of this? And yet, despite of those difficulties, there's still good in our lives. You know, the Israelites, they had food every morning despite being in a barren land. That's not a coincidence. Their clothes didn't wear out and their, their feet didn't swell for 40 years. That's not a coincidence. And neither is it a coincidence that despite trying and difficult circumstances in our lives, there is still good that fills our days. Friends, that's God's blessing in your life. And sometimes it's easy to miss because the dark times are kind of like, you know, clouds rolling overhead, kind of like this morning as you drove in. The sun is still shining out there, I promise you, but it's difficult to see through all of the bleak gray cloud, and sometimes blessing is that same way. There is still good in our lives, but hard times of life can make that hard to see. And that's why we would do well to take Moses' advice in verse 2 and remember Take time to remember all of the good that still fills our days. And more importantly, remember where all that good ultimately comes from. It's God's blessing on our lives. Sometimes bad circumstances, they make it hard to see that. Other times, though, the difficulty lies on the other end of the spectrum. Sometimes we can overlook or mistake God's blessing due to good circumstances or positive circumstances. And I know that sounds weird, but it's true, the good times of life can pose just as much distraction and cause us to overlook what God is doing in our lives. There are some of you here this morning, like we said, you may be feeling down and out, but there are others of us here, you may feel like you're on top of the world. You know, maybe work is going great, and your marriage is great, and your family is great, and your health is great, and everything else in life is, well, great. And if that's you this morning, we want to say, first of all, we are happy for you. And in that same breath, we want to say, be careful, because there's nothing like comfort and stability to cause us to overlook all of the good work that God is responsible for in our lives. That's the warning that God gave to his people in verse 10. Why don't you skip down and look at that? It says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Here's the warning. Verse 12, otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, and when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, in other words, when life is great, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The Israelites were in this difficult season, but things were about to change. 
You know, they were about to receive homes that were permanent and wouldn't move, that they could depend upon to, to be over their heads and give them shelter day after day. They were about to have uh, uh, fields to plant their crops and to raise their herds, a dependable food supply. They were about to have water sources that were dependable and steadfast. Life was about to get great, and that was kind of the problem. Because when life gets great, there is a temptation to forget where all of that greatness comes from, to believe that we are somehow responsible for it all. This is one of my favorite statues. It's by an artist named Bobby Carlyle. It's called The Self-Made Man. It depicts a, a muscular man, hammer and chisel in hand, and he is literally carving himself out of stone. With every blow of the hammer, he makes himself. And his destiny will be forged entirely by the strength of his own arm. And when he's done, whatever perfection or flaw resides in him, it will be the work of his hand and his hand alone. I love this statue because it makes me think and has a message. And it's a pretty apt illustration of our point this morning. There's a temptation in our lives to see ourselves as self-made men and women as if our lives are entirely the result of our own hands. Our flaws, yes, but our perfections and our blessings as well. There's this temptation to think, I am responsible for all the good in my life, when in reality, that's just not true. I mean, we already hit on it a little bit this morning. How much of our success has to do with chance or luck or good circumstances, or being in the right place at the right time, or being born in the right place, or being born in the right era. There's a lot of our success that has little to nothing to do with us, and yet we can convince ourselves otherwise. Jeff Bezos, or Bezos, however you want to pronounce his name, it's a name you may be familiar with. He's the founder and CEO of Amazon.com, world's richest man, a net worth of over $91 billion. Amazon is an amazing case study in success. I mean, they have revolutionized the global retail industry, and they corner every single market they touch without exception. They are a beast when it comes to making money. And Jeff is the founder of this company. It means he had the vision for it. He had the idea of it. And all of its success is the result of him and him alone, right? I know we all know that's not true, and, and Jeff would admit that's not true. You read his story, you find that he got his funding from his parents, so he had help right out of the gate. Kind of an interesting side note, when he proposed his business plan to them, their first question was, that sounds great, what's the internet? Um, <laughs> and today, they're, they're billionaires. You know, after Jeff got some success and some profitability, he, as quickly as he could, surrounded himself with capable and intelligent people to help him grow and expand this company. And then they continued to hire hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individuals to make this money machine run. There are a lot of people responsible for the success of Amazon.com. And yes, Jeff was the visionary. He is the leader. He still steers that ship, but he by no means is solely responsible for its success. And that same thing is true in our lives as well. There is a lot of good in our lives we haven't had anything to do with or we've had little to do with. I don't want to short sell anybody's efforts because I think you can make a biblical case that God's blessings seldom come ready-made. There is a call to cultivate and develop what he gives us, but neither can we sit here this morning and honestly say, I've done it all by the work of my own hand. That good comes from somewhere. You know, if there's good in our lives, it has an origin outside of ourselves, and that origin is ultimately in the God who blesses. But sometimes success and comfort and ease can cause us to lose sight of that and miss the sizable contributions that God makes to our lives. The warning given to the Israelites is pretty apt for our day and age today. We can't afford to overlook God's work in blessing us just because we're successful. Now, I hope that the thrust of this passage and really of this message as a whole is pretty clear at this point. Ultimately, whether we find ourselves in good times or bad times, whether it's direct or indirect, if there's good in our lives, ultimately it's come from God. It finds its origin in him. And that's what our passage seeks to emphasize as it closes in verse 15. As we read through this last passage, pay special attention to the pronouns that show up. Verse 15, God says, or Moses says, He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. 
He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known to humble and to test you, so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands has produced this wealth for me. But remember, this is one of my favorite verses in this book, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to you, your forefathers, as it is today. Did you pick up on that pronoun, which one shows up again and again, like four or five times? It's he, yeah. He, as in God. God is the one who is responsible for bringing these people out of this difficult season and into an abundant land. God was the one who produced the food and the water necessary to survive and endure. And now that they are entering into a good season of life, well, they will have success and homes and all these other things. God wants to remind them, look, don't forget who put you in this position to succeed. Don't forget who has brought you to this point where you can experience success. Don't forget who has given you the skills necessary to succeed and to thrive and to grow. Ultimately, if there is good in our life, whether we experience it directly from him or indirectly from him, it's still from him. God is the source of all good in our lives. I mean, we can get real existential for a moment and see this in ourselves this morning. Just by show of hands, how many of you out there exist I mean, right now, you are, you are really, truly real people. I don't see a lot of hands, to be honest with you. There ought to be more hands in the air. Yeah, we all have life. So how many of you chose that? You just said one day, you know what? I choose to be conceived. I will exist. It's kind of a silly question, right? Because we all know the answer. None of us. And yet here we are experiencing this life. That's a gift and a blessing, not done by our own hands, but by his. Or consider the nation into which you were born. Most of us were probably born native citizens of the United States. One of the most prosperous, if not the most prosperous nation in the history of human civilization. Simply by virtue of being born here, you have the opportunity to make your life in almost anything you choose it to be if you choose to seize that opportunity. If you work hard enough, that opportunity is there. Simply by virtue of living here, you can say or do pretty much whatever you want within the confines of reasonable laws without the fear of harm or prosecution. And simply by being born here, you have experienced more advantage than almost anybody on earth or in the history of earth. And most of us were just born with this privilege plopped into our laps. Let me ask you, how many of you chose to be born here and to receive this gift? How remarkably unsurprising that I see no hands. This is a gift that God has put in our lives, a blessing not achieved by our own hands. Or consider the time period into which we were born. The 21st century is notable for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is our advances in medicine. We lived at perhaps the most medically advanced time in human history where if a joint wears out, a lot of times we can just replace it with a new one. And we can go on with life as if everything's the same. We've been able to cure and in many cases prevent diseases that previously wiped out millions of lives and devastated entire continents. Today we get a shot and we're safe. The average life expectancy in the 1800s was somewhere between 30 and 40 in developed nations, meaning places like, you know, England and France and in developed nations, 30 to 40. Today, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but most of us can probably expect to live two to three times that without trying that hard. We live in an incredible time period in which we have healthy, long lives. Now, by show of hands, how many of you chose to be born in the 21st century? You said, I think it's going to be big. I pick that one. Nobody. That's a silly question, right? And yet here we are with this gift just given to us. This is God's blessing in our lives. These things that have given us the ability to succeed, the ability to cultivate success, the ability to cultivate the lives that we have and to experience all of the good that he places in our days. If there is good in our lives, whether it be experienced directly or indirectly, ultimately, That good comes from God. There's good in our lives. We've done absolutely nothing to procure. That's his hand upon us, folks. 
Now, there are a lot of reasons, like we said, we might overlook these things. We might mistake them as just coincidence or luck or whatever. But seeing the truth is simply a matter of having the right perspective. It's a perspective that remembers our God is the one who loves us. And we know that he loves us because he sent his son into this world to, to, to forgive us, to die on the cross in our, in our stead, to give us this unhindered relationship with God and to make our path straight. We know that he loves us because he sent Christ. That's the extent of his love, and that's the proof of his love. It's the proof that he's a good God who loves us and wants to bless our lives. So when you find yourself in those difficult seasons where things are hard, and it's hard to recognize his blessing and his, his work, remember Christ. Remember the extent to which he's gone to demonstrate his love to you and realize that a God that loves you that much is not going to abandon you in your times of struggle. He is still at work bringing good into your days. And when things are good and life is great, remember Christ. Remember how much you need that forgiveness and that grace that only comes through him so that you don't forget your need of God in all the other areas of life as well. The perspective that sees the blessing and the work of God in life is the one that remembers he's the God who loves us no matter what. Now, we said something last week, and I think it bears repeating this week. Here at First Christian, we firmly believe that we most fully experience the blessings of God through the person of Jesus Christ. So this morning, I want to propose this to you. If you want to receive that gift that God wants to give you, that gift of salvation, that gift of forgiveness, that gift of a fresh start, that gift of experiencing the fullness of his blessings in Jesus, there's a connection card on the back of your seat. If you'd take a minute just to fill that out and on the back left-hand side, there are a couple of options about starting a journey with Jesus. Put that in the collection plate when it comes by at the end of the service because we would love to get in touch with you and help you get started in this journey experiencing all of the good that God wants to give you through Christ. For the rest of us here this morning, we have a different bit of homework. I want to encourage you at some point during this week just to stop what you're doing and take stock of all the good in your life in that moment. It may be family, it may be a career, it may be something as simple as a really good meal. But if there's good in your life, I want you to recognize it, and more importantly, remember ultimately where that good has come from. It's come from the God who loves you and who blesses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness and for your mercy and your compassion and your generosity. We know that there is so much good in our lives, whether we find ourselves in favorable seasons or or difficult seasons. There's so much good in our lives that we are not responsible for and come from nowhere else but, but your kindness and your love. Father, thank you for these gifts and these blessings. I pray that reflection upon these would give us worshipful hearts that we might seek to live for you and honor you in all of our ways because of all that you've done for us and all that you give us, particularly the blessings that we have in Christ. Father, thank you for the hope and the joy and the assurance that we have because of him and the evidence of your love that we have because of him. And it's in his great name that we pray. Amen.